really far away from the airport and it's unsafe for them during the weather changes and also really expensive if they don't find um, someone who, who hooked them up. So the student who was reading the newspaper was discussing with a friend and he believes it's a really good option because it's gonna be less expensive for them and also it's safe because the school will provide uh, better options for students and it's gonna be easier if they find someone who helped them. I messed it up. <laughs> oh my God, you are! Let's see. Okay. For okay. question three, you will read a passage from a textbook. Listen, that was it. Then you will listen to Let's part see. of a lecture about what you have read. Using information from both the passage and the lecture, you will answer a question. You have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your response. You had a 35 second introduction. That's, that's bad. Oh my God. Also, we need to beef up your grammatical complexity. At the very beginning, you said a student wrote a letter. I want to implement okay. some passive voice and some grammatical structures you're going to see in that speaking structure that's going okay. to increase it because grammatical complexity has a strong impact in your overall score. And then you started talking about this conversation with the student and stuff like that. What we have to do is just employ a little bit more of the structure. And it seems like your conclusion definitely wasn't there. Then you said you messed up. So what happened? You said you messed up. What you mean? What did you mean by that? Because I went blank again. Oh. I ran out of ideas. I didn't know what to say. With structure, you ain't going to run out of ideas. That's why when you run out of ideas, it's time to implement that conclusion. So with that being said, these are the two reasons to why or as to why the student disagrees with the letter writer. You see what I mean? That's always going to be your lifeline. Sometimes you're going okay, to Okay, let me write it out. It. Um, so what did you say? Let's see here. Where is it at? Let me go grab it. Let me grab it. Okay, here we go. Let me go right over here. Let me go right over here. There it is. Okay, here we go. Where is it at? Oh, no. Well, let me write it down. Okay, here we go. These are the two reasons as to why the student disagrees with the letter writer or announcement. Bam. That's your outro. I guess you could say it. that is the outro. So why? Now, it, now, and just by showing you this, now, this is not what I wanted to show you just yet because I want you to go through the rest of it. But it's all good. But if okay. I were to, a letter was written by a student. Okay. Indicating that you see what I mean? I think I had made you one already. Probably not. I haven't made you one yet, right? Okay, don't worry. Like, right after you take this full test, you're going to have your new structure. It's going to be in green. Oh, okay, you're going to send that to Yeah, me? yeah, yeah. I got a new okay. one for you. This one says, Paula Herrera, but you, <laughs> I got to make one for you, okay? And so I'll be doing that right after. All right, don't worry. I got you. I got you. Okay, okay. So with that being said, this goes to show you that you didn't have that much of a structure or grammatical complexity. Do those two things. Practice that out loud over and over. Use that adaptability to sway by, sway by side and be able to adjust in you know different segments and different areas of the talk. You're going to be good. Okay? okay. All right. Here goes the question. Do but on the text now, today. read a passage about choice supportive bias from a psychology textbook. You oh have 45 God. seconds to read the passage. <laughs> Begin reading now. Oh, this is going to be fun. People love their medication, but can't do it all the time. Right. Take down some of these notes.
Now, listen to part of a lecture from a psychology class. Okay, so an example of this from my own life. Five or six years ago, I was helping a friend of mine decide on a house to buy. He had been in the market to buy a house, and he had it narrowed down to this one house that he was interested in. What he really liked about this house was it had an excellent location. It was in a great place that was actually in the same part of town where he was working, right up the street from his job, so he wouldn't have far to drive to get to work, which he really liked. However, the downside of this house was that it was smaller than what he was hoping to buy. He had wanted to buy sort of a big house, and this house just wasn't that big. So it was a tough decision, but my friend eventually did decide to buy the house. And a few years after he made the purchase, I remember we were talking about the decision and why he decided to buy the house. He told me, well, of course, it was because of the house's location. He told me how happy he was with the fact that it was so close to his work, how great it was that it was only a few minutes from his job. I said, yes, but what about its size? Do you still think the house is kind of small? And he looked at me kind of surprised. Small? What do you mean small? Like he didn't know what I was talking about. The house's size, a couple of years after buying it, just didn't seem to be on his mind anymore. Explain what choice supportive bias is and how the professor's example illustrates the concept. Prepare your response. Pick response. Here we go. I believe in you. Oh my gosh. It's okay. Ugh, a little overwhelmed. Makes a little sense. Now, answer the question. Let's go. The passage shown before was talking about selection bias as a process where people are uh, focus only on advantage and sometimes forget about the disadvantage of a choice. The professor during the explanation was putting an example of a friend who bought a house and the process of buy buying the house was it was on an excellent location and he was happy because it was close to work. But the disadvantage in that case is it's that the house was smaller. The professor made that example because while his friend was happy, Living in that house because it was close and it was in an excellent location, he forgot that the house was smaller than the one he was planning to buy before or buying before uh, deciding about his house. So that's why the professor uses uh, that example um, to explain how selection bias work. That people, uh, most of the time... All right, good. You spoke all the way through. For question four. You will listen yes, to part of an academic right lecture. Then like. you will summarize okay. information from that okay. lecture. You have 20 so seconds to prepare and 60 uh, seconds to record your response. It doesn't matter that I get cut off. I um, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a little bit of repetition of what was happening, okay? So if you actually look at that, there were a couple of times that you repeated things, but is that going to get you a 20? No. A 21? No. A 22? No. A 23? No. It should still get you a 24. The repetition, depending on the dumbass tea, la tea reader, the well, I'm sorry, the the team leader, the e-rater, whoever these clowns are, who are actually grading you, they should not hold that against you, right? However, I think okay. there are some things that we're going to have to make sure that we adjust so that it's a little bit better, okay? Okay. All right. And so, yeah, we're going to be, you know, like if I look at this, um, what is it? Another example that's related to this is the professor gave an elaborate ex uh, explanation pertaining to, and then I go further and further into it. Now, at the beginning, you said something shown before is about the selection bias, right? Me, I like to say the article provided relates to choice, okay. supportive bias, whatever it is, which is defined as, see, when we get this more grammatical structure in there and more structure overall, fantastic. What do you think about your note taking? I wrote uh, bias, 
selection bias only focus on advantages and then i put the example excellent location but smaller and then i put happy to be because it's close to worse and he forgot that it was smaller like i made narrows let yeah. me see i don't think you can see that no you can right it's okay. i don't know it's okay. why it's all right. good <laughs> enough good enough okay so all right so you do have a way and a system of going about taking these notes good like this okay good all right ah so you do write just a little bit though where's the yeah article? where's where's what the article notes the 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 reading notes did you take any no i just put selection bias only focus on advantages oh wow that's it okay that's kind of okay all right oh. be a lot of things okay that's why i got to do that video and show you exactly what i'm going to be doing okay all right got it got it okay well Let's do this last one, and we're going to dive into it. All right. 19, I, I'm going to get Now, listen <laughs> to part of a lecture in an environmental sciences class. Number four. Roads, paved roads, are everywhere and sometimes seem like part of the natural landscape. But, of course, roads are not part of nature. And, in fact, road construction can have harmful effects on the environment and seriously impact both animal life and plant life. One harmful environmental effect of roads is that they contribute to the movement of plant species from one area to another. This causes problems for existing plants, plants already growing in that area. Because when a new plant species gets introduced into an area where it wasn't growing before, the new plants compete for resources with the existing plant life. For example, this happened in California with a weed called the yellow star thistle. What happened was, the star thistle seeds got stuck to the tires of cars driving down the road, and the seeds were distributed to new areas. This put the star thistle in competition for natural resources, like water, with the original plant life of the area. That made it harder for the native plants to survive. Also, roads, especially major highways, can act as barriers and divide up an animal's habitat into smaller ones where there's not enough food to support the population. These busy highways, with cars speeding past day and night, act like boundaries that animals are afraid to cross. So they sometimes get shut in on a small piece of land where there isn't enough food to support them. This is a serious problem for animals that need access to large expanses of land to look for food. For example, there are these foxes, called kit foxes, that live in the southwestern United States. They hunt small animals like mice and squirrels, which are spread out over large areas of open grasslands. And now, because of these roads, the kit fox population has declined significantly, because now they don't get enough food. Using the examples of the star thistle and the kit fox, describe two ways roads can affect the environment. Prepare your response. Okay, prepare your response. Morgan Freeman. Let's see what we got. All right, the final one. Now, answer the question. Here we go. The professor was speaking in the environmental classes about roads and how they have helped humanity along the years. But they also represent a har harmful way to, for plants and species, especially because they uh, provoke movement of plants. And also that means that those plants need to compete for water or food. Talking about the rose, she made an example of how a plant called yellow star scissor in California was competing with the regular plants with water. Also, she made, she pointed out about how roads um, interfere with the food in the, with the animals, especially for animals who need lar large areas to be feed, like foxes or birds. Oh, just four seconds.